Mr. Ryan Collier, how are you doing today, sir? Could not be any finer. I appreciate you asking. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm hanging in there, having a good time, I think, given the circumstances. Um, I got to know, I mean, how, how have you been adjusting to life, you know, not being out and about, you know, shaking up the, the world of insurance? What, what have you discovered about yourself in amongst this kind of forced self-reflection? That's, that's actually a great question. My tolerance for conference calls has become much uh, greater. Uh, it seems like life revolves around conference calls now as opposed to face-to-face -face meetings without travel. Uh, there's a lot more time in the schedule, and I think it's, it's been great because I think we can break it down more to the people level now. And I mean, we talk about systems, and we talk about things like digital and digitization and digitalization, but at the end of the day, it comes down to people. And what I've been able to really dig into over the last month plus is the fact that this is a people industry, and I'm really, really spending a lot more time talking to people pretty much throughout the day. It seems like I have five to eight conference calls every single day of the week. And that to me has been very refreshing just to get back to the basics and this is the people industry and it's great to get back and talk to the people. What's, um, what's the, the thing that was maybe most unexpected that you've kind of discovered uh, during this time, maybe something that you had, you know, once kind of had a passion for, just kind of ran out of time, but you, is there anything that, that has kind of come up that you've said, Oh man, I used to do this. This is fun. I should do this more. Like, is there anything that you've kind of brought back into the fold now that you've kind of locked inside more? Uh, I can't say that's something I brought back, but I'm trying to learn how to play the banjo. I've yeah. never learned how to play any string instruments. I've never known how to play any banjos, guitars, ukuleles, any of that. But uh, getting a banjo for Christmas, this has given me a great chance to learn how to play the banjo. I try to practice it four or five times a week for 15, 20 minutes a week. And it's actually kind of, kind of cathartic to get in there and, and learn something new and try some dexterity that uh, I haven't uh, worked on hysterically or historically. How's it coming? You got any good banjo tunes already lined up or what, where, what's the skill level? Well, of course, I've got to work on uh, deliverance. Of course. That's the, uh, that's the key. So I've got about one quarter deliverance down at this point. So by the end of all of this, you think you got the whole thing? Could you commit to that or no, probably not? At a slow pace. I can't, yeah. I, I definitely, I am impressed with the, the talent that people have for these different instruments. It's really been a, a I, a humbling experience to say the least all right well outside of banjo skill level whether improving or not improving the speed of pace what's going on in terms of insurance uh, i mean what have you been seeing it's been it's been an interesting time uh obviously you know a lot of what you know we're trying to do at rps kind of plays into you know the current state of affairs but what what have, what have you been seeing just across the industry what have you been hearing what what has been coming out of these conference calls uh, mm -hmm. and everything well, I think it's interesting. I, I, can, I can see the dislocation in the different areas of our industry based on the users. And we've, we've, before the pandemic was announced, we had seen users across the country increasing probably 20 to 25% pretty, uh, pretty consistently around all of the different geographic areas, Northeast, Southeast, Midwest, et cetera. And the premium growth was probably closer to the 40, 45% range. What we've seen is a little bit of a dislocation for a couple of weeks as people started to adjust work from home. Not everybody in our industry, I'd say probably half of our industry wasn't prepared to move into a work from home situation immediately. So we did see some users, uh, I wouldn't say migrate, but we're seeing a little bit less growth in users. We actually saw for the first time this year, less users in a week, year over year. But interestingly enough, the premium is going up. So we're seeing less users actually it's come back already but uh, we're seeing still premium growth in the mid to high 40s range so we've held up the growth and i think the value prop that we're bringing to the retail brokers is being seen and now they're starting to appreciate the fact that we're not dislocated in a digital channel the underwriters have been dislocated just like we have on the brokerage side and with digital that doesn't happen you can still get your quote you can still find it you can still get your policy issued you don't have to worry about someone someone trying to figure out how to work from home and not being connected to their systems and not having the papers in front of them so i think it's been kind of neat to see the premium hasn't slowed down the premium stayed up uh, in the 40 45 50 percent range but the users we did see one or two weeks of dislocation where uses usage went down by person but not by quote so less people more quotes kind of interesting I was kind of curious about the premium volume. You think maybe because of all of this, you're just getting there, there. People are tossing larger size accounts through, through, and, and just as opposed to maybe relying on a traditional method that might be kind of slowed down during this time. 
It could be. Uh, we're seeing uh, last week, for example. So last week we saw 60.1% increase in policy count year over year. So if we look at the same week in 2019 versus the same exact week, so same store sales essentially, we saw a 60.1 increase in policy count and about a 55% increase in premium. So the, the size of the policies isn't changing much. We are seeing some really good growth on our, I call it the sledgehammer product, the DNO EPL fiduciary product for privately held companies. We're seeing a really good traction on that because that market has been extremely dislocated. Underwriters are much more diligent on asking a lot of questions. They're actually having quotes that they're pulling. We're seeing some carriers that don't want to honor the quotes that they had offered just a week or two earlier unless we get on a conference call with a customer. So it's adding a lot of friction through the traditional channels that we don't have in the digital channel. So we're seeing a, a nice uptick there, but I'll take 60% year over year growth on an established company anytime. And what do you think? I mean, so, you know, like you said, there's a lot of companies that weren't necessarily prepared to work from home. I'm assuming the same goes for agents, right? They're, you know, some of them, in, in some cases, they're working, they're not working, they, you know, they, they're, they're on the golf course, they're not on the golf course. But do you think, what, what, what is the biggest adjustment agents are kind of dealing with and how do you think that they should approach maybe selling business in a, in a much different way than they've, they've become accustomed to over the last, you know, may, maybe the entirety of their career? Well, I think it's a great question. I think there cannot be the, the reliance on new business because right now we're at a standstill for new business as an industry. You can't go out and make those new relationships. You can't go out and break bread or hit the golf course. So what we've seen, and I want to see a lot more of, is cross-selling. There is no reason in the world why the retail insurance broker should be trying to bring all of the products to their customer that they need to be resilient. I think there's been a great wake-up call that customers need to be taking a look at their entire portfolio of insurance and seeing how they can protect themselves from resilience. A great example is employment practice claims. Uh, with unemployment going up to like 22 million in the last three or four weeks, what's going to happen is you're going to see some more employment practice claims. And the reason being, if I can get fired from a job or lose my job and walk across the street and get a same or equal job, maybe get a couple more dollars per hour, I'm probably not going to bring lawsuit. But if I get laid off or terminated or furloughed and I can't find another opportunity across the street, then I might look at legal. I might look at my legal remedies and bring a lawsuit because I was wrongfully terminated based on sex, gender, any kind of bias that's out there, uh, age, height. I'm very tall. It's not a protected class, by the way. But employment practices is a product that's only got about a 17 or 18 percent penetration rate into the private companies why would only 18, one out of five, or less than one out of five, see that as a, an important coverage when the reality is all of those customers have that exposure? So we're seeing our retail brokers starting to wake up to the reality that cross-selling their portfolio is just as lucrative as finding new opportunities with new customers that are new to the agency. So I think that's, that's for me, very, um, very uplifting. It's something we've talked about, the cross-sell for years, and I'm starting to see that take over with retail brokers offering two and three and four different products through our platform to their customers. And the hit ratios are staying really good. So we're seeing a lot of that 60% growth is not new business, but it's selling an additional line of coverage for a product that we had already sold them for a coverage, our client that we'd already had previously. Is there one, is there a standout line that you think, um, you know, should be focused on first for agents to, to kind of bring to their clients. Again, there's a lot of these different sort of professional or executive lines types of businesses are, are the ones that are coming, put, being put in the spotlight, I guess, over the last couple of weeks. Yep. Um, is, there, is there a logical place to start if you said do this one first and then maybe work your way down? I, I, well, the logical one and the one that we, we have the most success with is cyber. With the work from home, there's a lot more potential exposure you have open ports, you have people using Citrix, you have people using Zoom. We've all heard the stories about Zoom and some of the different uh, issues they've had with lack of security. Cyber, every customer needs cyber. There's not a company in the United States that is in business that does not have a cyber exposure. And that cyber exposure has not gone down. Since the work from home has occurred, I would say the exposures for a company with work from home is probably up 40 or 50%. Because you have people utilizing different tools. You have their, their laptops, maybe on unsecured lines. I know there's a large insurance carrier that was recently hacked in the, in the news. And they were very public. Not they, but the company, but they, the bad guys, were very public in how they did it. 
And uh, it's just, it's a scary time. So if I had to say one customer that needs one client or one product, I would say it's, it's got to be cyber. The, the exposures are just too great. And that's where, if you think about it, about one out of seven standalone cyber insurance policies come through our platform. One out of seven. So we figured out the quote bind issue, the friction free process. And really the reason why we have one out of seven is not only our process is great, but the product is needed. So I would start with cyber personally. What do you think this is going to do for the conversation moving forward again, because so much of this is kind of brought up now. How do you think agents should or need to approach that renewal process again with the cross selling? I mean, is this something that they lead heavy handed with or, you know, I mean, is this just, is this kind of like, Hey, listen, like we've been talking about this for years you know, for the agents that have brought up some of these coverages that have maybe gotten ignored. Uh, th does this help the agent sort of just seal that door shut in terms of, listen, these are things that you've got to have because I mean, yeah, it's unlikely we're going to have another pandemic anytime soon, but guess what? You know, this types of stuff happens and we need to get a few more policies in place to make sure that you have a better chance to survive whatever the next thing is. Yeah. Well, I think, I think you hit it on the head. I think resilience is something that every retail broker needs to bring up with their customer. What can keep that small business resilient? If you, it, I know last year and it's probably changed. The average small business owner had about $12,000 in cash. If they're closed today, that $12,000 is probably gone. They will reopen hopefully. Uh, but that conversation needs to be one of resilience. If you have all of the products that can make you resilient, cyber being a, a big one that they probably don't buy today, that's, that's the retail broker's job. And one of the things we've seen that has increased our hit ratio by about 10% is utilizing a declination letter. So you give your customer, and it's not heavy handed, but you give your customer two different options. You give them a quote on one hand and you give them a declination letter on the other. And you walk them through and say, if you want the coverage, we've already done all the work. That's the key. You're not making your customer do a lot more work. But if you want this, this, this coverage, all I need you to do is review these handful of questions, sign it and date it, and we'll send you your policy. Friction, done. If you don't want this coverage, we give them a declination that says, I hereby understand the perils and pitfalls that I am going to potentially have if I don't buy this coverage, and I do not hold you responsible, Mr. Retail Broker or Mrs. Retail Broker, because you have told me about the exposures and they sign it and they date it. And that way the retail broker can put that in their file. When they give the client the retail choice of buy the coverage or prove to me that you haven't bought the coverage and, and give me my absolution that I don't have any exposure to you coming back and say, you never told me about that exposure. We're seeing the hit ratio go up into about the 10 to 12% extra range. Our hit ratio for our cyber product just creeped over 50% in the first quarter of 2020. What do you think we could possibly have to look at in terms of the pendulum swinging back the other way, right? With insurance, generally when there's more risk, there's more claims. When there's more claims, then that usually leads to a price increase. You know, what, what, should we, what should we be preparing for in terms of you know, the brokers and the agents out there for the pendulum to come swinging back? Um, do, do you anticipate there being any sort of, you know, kind of ramifications from that? Or do you think um, we're out in front of it enough to where it shouldn't be as big of an issue? I, I think we absolutely can see some price increases over the next quarter, year, maybe even two years. We already were seeing it. We're seeing a, a somewhat firming marketplace over the last couple of quarters by every standard. If you look at the CIAB standard, you look at any brokerage standard, we're seeing an increase in pricing. We could see more claims and we could see increased pricing. And honestly, if I'm a buyer, I don't like the increase, but it proves that the coverage is needed. The last thing I want is illusory coverage. I don't wanna pay a couple thousand dollars for a product that nobody ever has a claim in. So if I have a $3,000 product, it goes to $3,300 because actuarially that's what is needed to make that carrier solvent because everybody has to have a profit. Yeah. Then, then I actually, I'm okay with it because now I know the product is being used. What I don't want is a carrier to say, I'm going to take advantage of the situation and increase your price by 10% without the actuarial uh, background. And they're just doing it because they believe it makes sense or they can take advantage of it. That doesn't fly. But actuarial sound price increases, I fully support because that shows the product is being used and it's actually protecting the customers the way they need to be protected. So I, I do think we probably will see a continuing firming marketplace over the near coming future. You know, that's something that's always kind of, I don't want to say drove me crazy, but you know, having that sort of very factual educational sort of conversation around price, why it is, you know, I, I feel like a lot of agents kind of default to race to the bottom price conversation mm -hmm. and, and saying, like you said, like, I don't even know that I've heard it, you know, kind of summed up that good, right? 
like you said, there's a, there's a fine balance between what a carrier needs and, you know, taking advantage. And for, for an agent to effectively communicate that to their clients is going to be huge in terms of, you know, what's the difference? It's, yeah, it's 200, 300, whatever the increase is, but it's, you know, marginal in the sense of the overall big picture and kind of being able to communicate that effectiveness. I don't know if there's a question there. It's just something that I think is, is something that is not really thought of enough to have that thoughtful conversation of educating on how price is actually being impacted. Yeah, well, I've got I've got a couple of ideas on price, and I've always said I, I I was a producer. I was a producer for many years. I always told my client if it comes down to just being about price, if price is your so, and this is for retail brokers too, retail brokers and customers, if your sole factor is price, I'm not the person you need to hire. You need to hire the smartest kindergartner you can find that understands the greater than or equal to kind of the uh, the alligator mouth as we learned it back in school. Because that's all you really need to do. And that, frankly, is not a complicated job to say this is the lowest price. For me, it's the value of the product. And premium is just one factor, kind of a small factor. Because I've never had a single client in the history of my career come back and say, I really appreciate that price discount that I received last renewal when they get their declination letter because it wasn't the right product. It didn't have the right coverages built into it. So for me, the value proposition is understanding the true value of the policy, the coverages, the endorsements, the exclusions, the intent of the cover, the claims handling ability of the underwriter. That goes way, way, way deeper than just looking at the greater than and equal to of the price. And if you're a broker or your client that focuses everything on the greater than or equal to on price, you're in for a sad reality that day when the rubber hits the road and a claim comes in. And I can almost guarantee the client's not going to say, wow, I'm really glad I saved the 300 or 3000 or $30,000 at the renewal by buying the cheapest product that just left me with an uncovered claim. So for me, price is like the third or fourth or fifth characteristic I look at when I'm trying to place a piece of insurance for my customer. And I'm really wishing the insurance industry would take that focus as well. It's not on price. It's on value. And those are two completely different things. I guess I kind of just railed on that topic a little bit. No, I mean, it's all good I've been stuff. in this a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's all good stuff. I, I think, uh, I think you know, value is one of those words that kind of gets you know, used around a lot. But the, the actual, you know, when you're actually really saying this is the true value of, of what we're dealing with. Do you think um, in, in dealing with with any of that, is there is there um, is there any sort of upside to what we're dealing with now? What, do you think this is going to push sort of our, our hand in terms of where, you know, we're going to be accepting of what business is as usual. We've always been accused of being slow to um, adapt to things. Is this going to kind of accelerate that? Or is this kind of just pulling off the bandaid, kind of exposing the, the, the giant hole? Is this going to give everybody that has kind of beaten this drum for, you know, five, 10 years, whatever justification and listen, like we really need to get serious about how we can deliver our products more effectively. I, I hope so. I really hope so. It's, it's something that we, we have an analog industry. We have an inert analog industry. Uh, Adam Clauber, I'll give Adam a shout out. He's an analyst that follows a lot of stocks. He does it for William Blair. So I'll give Adam Clauber, William Blair, a great shout out. He did a report on insure tech based stocks in the insurance industry. And almost all of them have an outperform rating. And he goes through and very articulately uh, spells out exactly why they have an outperform rating because they're much more nimble. They can react much quicker. I think if this has taught us anything, we need to be able to react a lot quicker than we do as an industry because we're an inert analog business. So I'm hoping it does rip the Band-Aid off. But at the end of the day, if we go back to BAU, business as usual, and people think, oh, we survived, that's not the, that's not the right way to look at it. It's not, did we survive? It's, did we thrive? And I want to make sure that as an industry, we take more of a did we thrive approach rather than a did we survive approach. And I'm, I'm fearful that a lot of the analog thinkers will say, oh, we, we weathered the storm, we survived. And that, that to me is, is a loss for the opportunity that we could have in front of us right now. Have you heard any good uh, stories on that thriving in terms of, you know, what, what has come across, you know, RPS's plate in the last couple of weeks um, where, you know, people are getting the coverage in place. Is there any, is there any good, you know, kind of stories that have come up? I, there's a ton of them, actually. I got dozens of them. I'll give a shout out to Rodney Chu. Rodney Chu, who's on the executive lines team, just sent me a really good win. It was a six figure win. And he led with the platform sledgehammer, the DNO EPL fiduciary product where it was two days before renewal with another retail broker 
And he was able to very quickly put an option on the table. They got the door open for the client to think about the proposal for Rodney and his retail partner. And not only did they lead with that, they actually won the entire platform or the entire product, the entire insurance program. And it was about $150,000 win. And it was all done because Rodney thought differently and he used the platform for its benefit of ease of use, that friction free. There's no way you can get an underwriter to turn things around that quickly in today's world. He was able to go in in about three minutes, get the option for the customer. The customer was dumbfounded that he could react that quickly. So two days away from the renewal, and we were able to snag that $150,000 renewal, all lines away from the, uh, the incumbent broker. That to me is outstanding. That's thinking differently, that's thinking digitally, and that's thriving. That's not just saying, oh, it's two days away from renewal, nothing we can do, ho-hum. That was, hey, it's two days away from renewal, I got plenty of time to get the job done. If the client's got time, I've got time. Here's your option, what do you think? And we blew it away. Yeah, it's taking the the whole days conversation down to you know hours to minutes. So that's always been fascinating. Um, how far? I, I, this is purely just me and you having fun here. How far do you think we could push it responsibly in terms of of you know making sure we're delivering that sort of bleeding edge experience, but while still realizing that this is insurance and there are certain things that just need to be considered. I don't know if we can get it down below the two minutes. I don't know, but we can sure as heck try. But here's here's the thing I find interesting. You could build a house, not you. I don't know if you can build a house. I know I can't, but I a, human, a human can have a house built or a car built quicker than an insurance policy built from a lot of our insurance carriers. How sad is that? Hmm. You could actually go start to finish house build or start to finish car build and beat the start to finish insurance policy build. And that to me is just asinine, if I can use a, a word that's not quite a swear word, but kind of fun. Hmm. We're not going to be able to get below the one or two minutes, I don't think, but we are working with some pretty neat data partners that I think might be able to help us get that one or two minutes down to 30 or 40 seconds. So we can maybe even get a little blood out of the turnip. But right now, there, like you said, that's insurance. There is a couple of things that we need to do, but uh, we do have some nice irons in the fire with some data partners that might be able to allow us to get all of the data we need for the customer in order to generate the quote without that much more needed from the retail broker or the client. You know, as you're talking, I kind of thought about, you know, some of the conversations that I've had with agents over the years, and there's always sort of this, the, the relationship is the relationship, right? That's what the industry is built on. And they always come back to, well, if I've got the relationship, I, the, the, the time is kind of irrelevant to me. And it feels like they're dismissing, like they're taking advantage of their, um, you know, their, their clients time, like they're, they're assuming that they don't want something easier because they have that relationship. But uh, I think I've always kind of countered that with that just gives you more time to do something more valuable as opposed to just dealing with the administrative end of it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've never heard your opinion. I'm kind of curious. You don't get paid to administer policy and paper movement. We just don't. We get paid to service our customers. So why would we want to add the friction and administer or place paper? We don't want to push paper back and forth. We don't want to push emails back and forth. If we don't respect the fact that the most finite and precious asset we each have is time, there's not much I can really do or you can really do to help that individual. I do know there's an inherent fear that if we go too digital, that's going to make people's jobs irrelevant. Could be further from the truth. Focus on the part that is great. Meeting with clients, consulting with clients, working through the client's resiliency plans. Don't focus on trying to put together an insurance quote by sending an email, waiting for the email to come back, sending another email back and forth, back and forth eight times over the course of two weeks. Just doesn't make any sense. Take the time to work with your customers and help be the best advocate consultant for them. Don't spend that time in the back office. The back office does not drive profit. The back office drains profit. Hi, Ryan. I got two more questions. One is we've talked a lot about, you know, what, what's kind of happening, what, could potentially happen and you know maybe where the edge of this all is but i'm curious what is what is next for you like what do you think is next like what's right around the corner where do we have the opportunity to come out of this you know even stronger you know agents and stuff like what what is that thing that is right around the corner that you know this might have kind of illuminated for us in a much different way i can't say retirement's right around the corner that's not an option <laughs> i mean you can i'm not going to stop yeah. you yeah well i appreciate that you know what, what's right around the corner we really want to have a one-stop shop and that means the retail broker can get whatever they need for their customer. And we tie into their back office systems because we know that every retail broker has an agency management system. 
So I want to try to bring the, the full circle. If you have a customer and they need 12 different products, we'd like to be able to bring those 12 products to you in a matter of a couple of minutes and then tie them right back in and drop them into your agency management system to really make it a, uh, to me, it's a holistic approach to friction-free placement. If your customer needs workers' comp or they need property or they need GL or they need higher non-donned auto, they need cyber, whatever the need is, I want to get to the point where we can provide that need extremely efficiently and the quantification behind it. How much does somebody buy? So it's not just what should you buy, it's how much should you buy. So my whole goal is to work toward getting to that utopia of being able to bring a one-stop shop to the retail broker where they can click a couple of buttons over a couple of minutes and provide the entire proposal to their customer for every product they need and how much of that product they need as well. That certainly sounds like a nice place to be in terms of uh, an insurance world, but bringing it back down to wrap up last question to you, Ryan. Well, that's very- not realistic. No, I, th- I think it is. I mean, it's, it's not next. It's not tomorrow. That's for sure. Yeah. It's not next week. No, I mean, it's certainly different than the, you know, the reality most agents are dealing with, you know, right now, but I think one that would be welcomed does it exist. Um, you know, but you know, bringing it right back home in terms of the thing they can do right now, I, I'm always fascinated with what that one thing is, right? If you, if you had one thing to tell an agent to do right now in terms of everything that's going on, what is the one thing that you would prioritize the most over everything we've talked about, over their, their opportunities, where they can get the best bang for their buck? Well, it's going to sound corny, but I've been telling my teams right now, protect yourself, protect your families, protect your customers. So on the personal side, I think that's a great order. Protect yourself. Just like when you're on an airplane and they have those oxygen masks come down, you don't put it on your child first because if you don't take care of yourself first, you're not going to be around to help the child put it on. So in today's world, we got to make sure we stay healthy. We got to make sure we keep our families healthy. We got to take care of our customers. So if there's one thing to focus, it's on the people. And I think if we can genuinely be educated on the insurance industry to help our people thrive, to help our people be resilient. And I say people, every business is is made up of people. It's not just a nameless, faceless entity. It's It's a business. So take it down to the people level. Let them understand the exposures they have. And then take out the back office. Take out that inefficiency of pushing paper from point A to point B and really, really, really focus on the people and what makes this industry tick, which is service. Serve the customer, serve their needs, help them exist next year, next decade, next century, if that's all possible. I think it's a noble industry. The insurance industry is a noble industry and we're just getting started. All right, Ryan. Awesome stuff, man. I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joey. <laughs>